We got the forms all stripped off. So now, before we can lay these ICFs, what we need to do is cut the sill plate and some of the studs. See, so we got them all marked out here. And we'll just cut each one. And basically, we're just cutting it an inch and five eighths above where the foundation is going to sit. That way we can put our sill plate in there, which is inch and a half, and then we can shim it up the other eighth of an inch. And I just want to leave that extra eighth of an inch just because things aren't like crazy accurate like that when you're doing foundations and concrete and stuff. So we're going to get these all cleaned up and cut and ready to place the ICFs. So I'm on my way to Massachusetts. I gotta get these insulated concrete forms. I'm just gonna pick them up myself from my trailer. Alright, so I'm at the insulated concrete form factory, or warehouse at least. So they're gonna load me up with some of these forms. So today is above freezing and the snow is starting to melt. It's a perfect day to get this drainage in and taken care of, covered up so the frost doesn't bother us as much. Thank you. 
So after measuring for putting these pieces of rebar in, now we have them in the right spot. So now we can start laying these forms out. be where our common splice is on this wall. So that splice is going to go all the way up to the top and we'll put a board on each side of it.
we discovered that if we cut this one off, then we can put the one on the top still on so it secures it. So now we can bend this in far enough to get this other piece over top of it and then it can go in the loop that's on the top course. See, we only have two corner pieces. That's the only struggle that we had. And then after that, the pieces go right in the middle of the webs. And it's not like in a very specific spot like this one is. So it's easy to just slip the piece of rebar in right there. So what we do is just take and dip it in epoxy and then just guide it through wherever it needs to go. Just poke it in and then beat it in with a hammer. It's pretty important that you get all the dust out of there too. You can either take a blower with compressed air and blow it out or you can take, in our case we used a vacuum with a small tube on it. Since this is a pretty long wall, we're going to put some whalers on it. And I have this bracket that you can just find at your local box store. And it, what's nice about this, it's not just a piece of angle iron, it's, it's got this gusset in it. The idea is that we're going to hang the ledger board from here. We're going to bring the concrete out to the edge. So we cut these and we put a piece of plywood over it. What I wanted to do was add like sort of a built-in gusset onto this so you can see like the angle of the concrete comes up. I didn't want it to just end like this, um, especially if there's going to be a bolt right next to the edge. I wanted to make sure that we got some good amount of concrete around that bolt, you know, two inches around every side of it is ideal. Said, there's so many different ways that you can do this um, I just picked this one because it didn't require anything special the next time I do this I'll probably order some brackets from this company um, 
and they make some universal brackets too. But this will be just fine. The only thing that you wouldn't want to do is frame this up right away after you pour. You definitely want to let that concrete set up before you do that. Um, but we're right into the holidays right now and we still got to pour this floor and do a couple other things, you know, closing that wall, that sort of thing. So we can afford to kind of let this rest and cure for a while and then we can drill for those wedge anchors and then you're not drilling green concrete. We're also gonna put some jacks going right from that ledger board right down to the footing. So it's definitely not going anywhere. I'll show you guys the load calculations on this floor and you'll see that it's more than adequate to do what we're doing. So the way we're gonna frame this floor is the joists are gonna go like this and we're also gonna have a girder beam right here for them to tie into. So right here I made a beam pocket You can see I just have that about two inches there of a ledge for that to sit on. That way there's a half inch behind it for airspace and then there will be an inch and a half of bearing. And then there's also a half inch on each side for air to flow. It's not pressure treated so you can't just put it up right against the concrete.
So it's a little bit messy, but we're gonna cut off the top two inches of foam anyway, so that doesn't matter. But we were short on concrete. The, the concrete company thought I said three yards. Really, I said five and a half yards. So they found the mistake in the paperwork and they're sending another truck now. So we got this whole other corner we still gotta do here. Just waiting on that truck to come here. I'm gonna try to clean up these ICFs on the inside. Luckily, they're only about 20 minutes away. So it's only about a 45 minute delay. So as you guys are watching this, you're probably thinking, why are you cutting the foam and taking the foam away on the inside there? Well, the reason is because we need the concrete to be below that level when it's done. So we want the top of the concrete to be five and a half inches. That's why we also put that two by four that was cut down to about three inches in, and also that piece of plywood on the top of that. That is so that when it's done, as you can see now, it is going to be five and a half inches wide. So the reason for that is because we're hanging the floor below the top. So we're going to hang a ledger board from this wall. And the top of the ledger board is going to be at the top of that foam that you can see right now. So then we're going to go over top of that with a vapor barrier and then put our plywood just that couple extra inches going in. That way it meets up with the wall and there's no concrete sticking out when it's done. Maybe it sounds a little complicated, but when I get all done with it, you'll understand why. I'm just putting a primer on there, and then you put this tape, it's a, like a mesh tape, and then you put another layer on top of that, and that's just for the horizontal versus vertical joints. So this is the peel and stick tape that you put on there, and then it's got like a fabric on the top, and then you coat over it again.
So we put our first layer on and we put our joint tape on. So now we're ready to do the second layer and coat over top of the tape and then do another third layer. If you prime anything with this Blue Max stuff here, then this tape will stick to it. It doesn't matter what it is. Look how nice this sticks to the concrete once you prime it with the stuff. You just put a little bit of pressure on it, it sticks right to it and it doesn't come up. This is like a felt material. You have to let this stuff set up before you do that though. You can tell when it's set up, when it's turning lighter colored or translucent. Once you stick it to there, it's not coming up and it's pretty cold out too.
we're just taping the seams with this gorilla tape and then heating it up with a heat gun it makes it stick really nice so that way any kind of seams are taped off We're just backfilling by hand so that it's nice and gentle against the building. And what we do is kind of stack it up as far as you can by hand. And then you got this big gully right here and you just fill that in with a skid steer or whatever. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can waterproof a building. This is really not meant to be waterproofing though, it's just meant to be damp proof. But the material should waterproof it actually, but the requirement is only for damp proofing. That geo is wrapped down and around the footing. Basically that geo is there to protect the poly and the poly is there to protect and waterproof the foundation. But the main waterproofing is the actual liquid itself which is Blue Max. It's made by Ames. It works pretty good. You can use it for like pools if you wanted to. But it's just the only thing about it is it's not meant to be out in the sun. The UV rays will affect it so you have to put a top coat of a latex paint on top if you want to keep it above grade or outside in general but other than that it works really well So we're going to give this another week or so before we actually take these jacks out and take these beams off. Right now all the weight is still on these beams and the jacks. We'll just let this concrete cure for a little bit longer and then we'll drop it down on that. Well there's nothing dropping down it's just we're just transferring the load that's all. 
So I know a lot of you are wondering, why are you doing things so weird with the foundation? Why don't you just bring it up to the top and then just frame on top of it like, like a normal house would be framed? Well, the reason is because over here, the elevation is kind of messed up. So there's the driveway right there. And there's that foundation right there. So basically, I was trying to balance it between the foundation being high enough where the water can drain away from it, but also being low enough to, to match the other side of the house. Because we don't want this to be like a two foot step up from the other part of the house. So I had to keep that as low as possible, but also keep the foundation as high as possible. So I'm kind of fighting two things and I found a balance point right in between that works for both things. But it was like a game of quarter inches. Literally, that's what it came down to. So right now, the top of that foundation is about even with this area over here. And we, we were able to get this swale in here because you got to have six inches of pitch within the first 10 feet from the building. So we don't want to do that and then have a retaining wall over here because we did that. So right now, we got a good balance. So that's why we're trying to play with the elevation so much instead of just slapping the foundation up there and putting the sill plate right on top and then framing up a normal convention way where you just rest right on top of the foundation. That's 90% of the houses that I build, that's how you build it. But in this case, it's kind of a special circumstance. So that's why we have the height difference and we're trying to stay so high on the outside but it's so low on the inside with the floor height. So you can see after we took off the plywood here, we have these little concrete extrusions, which brings the concrete out further. So now I can put two wedge anchors in here. And there's about a four foot span on here for this ledger board. And the calculations for that are not much because there's a girder right here. So it's only taking the weight of about 10 foot span on these floor joists. So if you do the calculations at 40 pounds per square foot, plus the dead load, which is not much because it's only two by eights, and the Advantech three quarter plywood, that's not a lot of weight. So if you take the load calculations, what this is, this is about 14 feet this way, and it's gonna have an 11 foot span that way. And remember, it's only taking half of the weight of that. So we'll just do the calculations on that. And basically, if you have an 11 foot span times 14, which it's not even, it's only like 13 because it's inside the wall. So that's 154. And then you're gonna divide that in half. Divide it by two. That's 77 square feet that we're holding up with this side of the wall. So then you take that and times it by, let's just say 50, because it'll be 40 plus the materials. So figure about 10 for the materials. Let's just even be safe and go 55. So that's 4,235 pounds that you're putting on this wall right here. Now let's divide that up by four spots because that's how many we have there. So divided by four. So each one of these extrusions will only see 1,000 pounds with two bolts there. So that's how you can figure that out. So like I said, I'm also gonna put some jacks going right down to the footing. Um, just a two by four that's tap conned in so that it can't move. Um, that alone would be good enough. But we also have these extrusions which we're gonna have the wedge anchors and epoxy on. So a lot of you are like, well, that's crazy. That's just all kinds of stupid stuff that you're doing. But really, like I said, I'm trying to achieve a low floor height with a high foundation height. And the reason I needed to do it over here with the height is because I'm matching over there, which is where we had the other foundation. So you don't want to drop down the top of the foundation height from one to the next foundation. But I told you how I started off with the original height and I had to continue it here. And it's the same thing. I don't want this to come over to here and then be way up here with the floor height, which is what would happen if I rested on top of there. So some people are saying, well, you could just dig deeper, but that really doesn't do anything because the top of the foundation needs to be where it needs to be. 
and then the floor needs to be where it needs to be. So one mistake I think that we made that we could correct next time would be to start out with the height of two sill plates on here to begin with. That would have made pouring that concrete so much easier to finish. Um, I thought an inch and a half was enough room, or an inch and five eighths was enough room, but it really just wasn't. We had to struggle to get that concrete flat. And also, when we're done, what we're gonna do is take a pressure treated sill plate and put it on the bottom here. And we're gonna be able to put the gasket material underneath of that sill seal. And then once we lay that flat, then we can slide another one on top of that once that one's already in place. So we had to recut these another inch and a half higher. But if we didn't cut them, then basically we would try to put the sill seal on here and then we would try to push the board on and it would crumple up the sill seal. So that's no good. So that's another reason why that was kind of a mistake. It, so it cost me probably about two hours to recut these, but it is what it is. It's, it's right now and I'm, I'm much happier with it the way it is now. It's gonna be so much easier to put these sill plates on. So what it's gonna mean is there's gonna be a double sill plate, but there's nothing wrong with that. The first one will be pressure treated. The second one doesn't have to be. So there's probably a lot of you watching that are wondering why we don't have any vents in here. And that is because I never install a vented crawl space ever. Um, all my basements or crawl spaces that I install are always a conditioned space. There is no other way to go. Um, a vented space is kind of like really old school. Not a lot of people even do that anymore. To qualify for a conditioned crawl space, really all you need is insulation on the walls. You need a vapor barrier on the floor and you need a heating system that joins and does something. Like if you have vents, you can just put one duct into this crawl space and that's good enough for heating. Or you can put a small crawl space heater, utility heater, or in this case, we're gonna have radiant heat. So either way, as long as you keep the space heated, it doesn't have to be the same temperature as the rest of the house, although ideally it should be, that qualifies it for a conditioned crawl space and then you don't have to vent it. When you vent, a basement or a crawl space, it makes the floor really cold and then you put insulation on the floor. But in this day and age, that's kind of really old school and nobody does that anymore. All the basements now are conditioned and even attics are now starting to get into the point where they're conditioned a lot too. So just to let you guys know, we are installing a radiant heat system in this house and it's going to be connected to a geothermal system. The geothermal is going to be water to water with a pond loop as the ground source. So I know a lot of you are probably wondering why I made the switch from regular forms into these ICFs. Well, there was a couple different reasons. First of all, I wanted to get this done as quick as possible because I knew the cold weather was setting in and I definitely just wanted to get this done before I dealt with the really cold, frigid weather. It's been a while since I've messed with ICFs and the reason was always because of cost. Um, because you really don't need insulation on both sides of that foundation wall, but it does make a, a lot better system. Now, ICFs have kind of come down in price since I really messed with them last, so I'm kind of glad that I made the switch. I think I'm probably gonna be done with the regular conventional forms. It's kind of neat the way it works, but really this is just more convenient. It's so much easier and quicker. Um, it drives the cost of the foundation up a little bit, but. You know, another thing that kind of made me want to switch too is the last couple foundations that I priced out, the customers told me that, that all the other companies that wanted to install a foundation wanted to use ICFs. So I'm finding that even local concrete companies that just do foundations are switching to the ICFs. So that got me thinking like, well, I need to get on that train too, because I definitely want to stay with the newest products. I kind of also thought that ICFs were more of a homeowner type of thing or a DIY type of thing. I kind of figured that like just regular foundations using forms, conventional Simons forms is more of a professional type of thing. But I guess it's just getting to the point where the ICFs just make more sense even for a pro, somebody that does it a lot to use. Because you, you really can just bang them out a lot quicker and it does give you a better envelope as far as insulation on both sides. The waterproofing is a little bit more of a pain in the butt, but that's something I can deal with, with all the benefits of the ICFs. I don't see why 
that's too much of an issue. You save a lot of time in other places. So to give you a little background on this company that I'm using, this is Build Block, and I did a lot of research and I found that I like these guys the best. Um, I'm gonna be using them on a big project coming up and they have all different types of ICFs that you can use for floors and walls and roofs and stuff like that. I'm gonna be using them going forward on all my ICF projects. So I already have a bunch of projects planned out in the next few months. As soon as the weather breaks, I'm going to be doing some really neat stuff with this company with their products. So follow along and I'll show you what we're doing with that. Just getting everything to this point is a big milestone because now we don't have to worry about the frost freezing underneath of the footings as long as we keep minimal amount of heat inside. So we'll keep plugging along at backfilling this and the top six inches will still be exposed. And then that way the bottom of the footings will always have four feet between there and the grade, which is what's required in this area. The next few steps after this, after backfilling, is going to be pouring the slab inside, which is just a rat slab. And then we're going to frame in the floor, frame in that wall. And then we're going to do some more framing for some interior walls, do some plumbing and some electrical. And... That can all be done in cold weather, but at least we got this part done for now, so I'll see you in the next one.